Today, I am going to uh, give you a short lecture on psychoanalysis, another interesting area in our literary studies. It is generally remarked that the late 19th century was blessed with the birth of three great men, or three luminaries, better say. They were Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Sigmund Freud. They radically transformed the intellectual landscape of the future by being visionaries who could foresee things and who infused a spirit of new spirit of inquiry, particularly in the field of intellectual inquiry. Similarly, we have another trio produced during the late 20th century corresponding to these three people. We have Ferdinand de Saussure, we have Derrida, and we have the French Freud named Jacques Lacan. So today the objective of this presentation is to introduce the basic concepts of psychoanalysis to you. As we all know, Psychoanalysis has been the most controversial, most abused of all approaches to the study of literature. No wonder, because it is based on certain premises that are extraordinarily shocking and unacceptable to ordinary minds. I am going to begin with a preview of the basic uh, ideas postulated or expounded by Sigmund Freud. After analyzing or explaining the few concepts introduced by Sigmund Freud, probably I will move on to his theory of the human psyche, which is divided into three mental zones like id, ego and superego. From there, I will uh, discuss his theory of infantile sexuality or uh, psychosexual development. And it will conclude with an assessment of the kind of contribution made by Sigmund Freud as a great thinker. Freud, after making careful analysis of several case studies, which he conducted himself as uh, a psychoanalyst, particularly the case studies like Anna O, Eisman and others, he has come to the conclusion that most of our actions or human actions are unconscious in nature. What appears to be conscious doesn't remain conscious for a long period of time. It becomes latent and it gets transformed into what is known as the unconscious. In his Anatomy of the Mental Personality, an article written by Sigmund Freud, he discusses this issue at length and he says that there are two levels as far as the human psyche is concerned. The first level he names it as the conscious, which remains conscious as I said already for a short while. Then it falls into the latent stage, it turns into the unconscious. Most conscious processes are conscious only for a short while. This is what he emphasizes while he talks about the conscious. And he here introduces the metaphor of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. The greater weight and density lie beneath the surface, which means that only one tenth or so of the human psyche happens to belong to what is known as the realm of the conscious. The greater weight and density, you know, they happen to be beneath the surface, almost 9 by 10. Which is actually another way of saying that our actions are mostly unconscious. And the second level that he refers to is the unconscious, which he subdivides into pre-conscious and unconscious proper. The preconscious is the region of the human psyche where, you know, we can do certain things but we slip into the unconscious 
but it's possible to come back or to transform into the conscious again, which is not very difficult. That is called the pre-conscious. So we slip into the unconscious, but coming back is not impossible. It is possible. We can come back to conscious. Again, we slip back into the unconscious. This realm is known as the pre-conscious. Whereas the second realm is referred to as unconscious proper. Once we fall into this state, coming back is almost impossible and extremely difficult. To come back to consciousness is almost difficult. And now let's have a look at the three major premises of the Freudian psychoanalysis, which is better known as the talking cure. The name itself is self-explanatory because talking is the way in which you know, the analyst and the analysant. Analysant is the patient undergoing trauma or having symptoms, neurosis or psychosis. An analyst is the therapist or the doctor who is always actively engaging himself in conversation with the analysant or the patient. And that is why psychoanalysis is otherwise called the talking cure. The first premise of Freudian psychoanalysis is this, that most human actions or individuals human actions, or individuals or human actions in general could be described as mostly unconscious. Secondly, Freud, it looks like, uh, you know, apparently like a controversial statement. All human behavior is motivated ultimately by sexuality and there is a kind of psychic energy that we all possess and of all these energies Freud believes that the sexual energy named libido libido is the most significant one and thirdly Freud says that since society always puts upon the individual certain restrictions in the form of taboos and prohibitions. The individual is sometimes on occasions constrained to suppress or repress some of his desires in the interest of the social well-being or social welfare or for the sake of the society. These repressed desires which cannot be expressed in the open will form the unconscious. These are the three basic premises of Freudian psychoanalysis. Now let's have a brief look at the three psychic zones identified by Freud, which he calls the mental apparatus. He traces the anatomy of the mental apparatus or what we call the human mind or psyche. There are three zones. He identifies three zones. The first is the id, the second is the ego, and the third is the superego. Id, according to Freud, is, it is completely unconscious. And only a small portion of ego and superego are conscious. This is really surprising. That id is totally under the unconscious and only a small part of ego and superego belong to the realm of the conscious. Let's have a look at what is id. Id according to Freud is the reservoir of the libido or the sexual energy, the primary source of all our psychic energy, libido. The function of the id is to fulfill the primordial instincts the primitive instincts, the basic instincts and it always obeys or functions according to the pleasure principle. The ultimate objective of human life is to seek pleasure always. So the song of the id is always focused on deriving maximum pleasure. So it follows the pleasure principle. It is obscure, I quote, it is obscure, inaccessible, and, you know, it is obscure and inaccessible because we cannot identify where the id is located. 
and Freud interestingly he describes it as something like a region filled with chaos a cauldron of seething excitement a cauldron a melting pot you know with seething excitement always because it needs pleasure nothing else the second is the zone of the ego it is exactly uh, you know the ego which protects the individual from the ravages of the id there is constant struggle between the id and the ego and it is uh, thought of as a, in freudian psychoanalysis ego could be thought of as something like uh, the regulating mechanism or the agency uh, which will always try to keep the individual normal in his behavior it is in other words the rational governing agent of instinctual drives and desires and it helps in non destructive behavioral patterns in ensuring non destructive behavioral patterns it stands for reason and good sense and remember if id is governed by the pleasure principle the ego is always governed by the reality principle it acts as an intermediary between the world within and the world without the world within is our mind the world without is the larger world or the society now let's come back to the superego zone the third zone identified by freud is the superego superego is the one realm which enables uh the society to be protected from the ravages caused by an individual in other words the ravages of the id could cause trouble to the existence the larger existence in society and the society is well protected by the operation of the super ego it is in other words it could be described as the repository of our social morality it always aspires for higher things in human life values mores morality everything the social aspect of our morality could be described as the super ego you know it always keeps a vigilant check on the operations of the id and the ego and the constant struggle between the id and the ego the conflict is amiably resolved by the operation of the super ego therefore it is always trying to keep the id on the check control and at the same time it resolves the conflict between the ego and the id remember one very important thing id is governed by the pleasure principle whereas ego is governed by the reality principle remember the super ego is governed not by either the pleasure principle or the reality principle but it is governed always by the morality principle so these are the three psychic zones identified in the second model of the human psyche introduced by sigmund freud otherwise known as the second topography of the human psyche now uh, let's have a quick look at the theory of psychosexual development introduced by sigmund freud you know he identifies that the early years of a child say for about the first 5 years of a child this is the period that he covers under his discussion and he divides the entire period into two broad you know categories one is called the first is called pre edipal stage and the second or the latter is called the edipal phase the pre edipal stage of course uh starts with uh the oral stage this is uh during this period the child is completely dependent for its survival nourishment uh on others particularly its mother it needs food it has to survive in this world there is no distinction between the child and its mother 
So there is one part of the body that becomes very active, that is the mouth. And that is why this is called the oral stage, which is used to suck milk from the mother's breast. But according to Freud, surprisingly, he says that even though the erectogenetic son, it produces something like, you know, some eros for the child when it sucks the mother's breast. And this is the first dawning of sexuality as far as Freudian psychoanalysis is concerned. And he says, interestingly, uh, sucking the mother's milk doesn't provide physiological uh, comfort by you know, quenching the hunger of the child. But it also provides something like an erotic pleasure to the child for the first time. And therefore, in this phase, the mouth which is used to suck the milk of the mother becomes the erotogenic soul. Now, let's move on to the second phase that comes under the broad category of pre-Oedipal phase, which is known as the anal stage. Here, uh, you know, the part of the body which becomes very active during this second phase is the anus. Because the child derives some kind of erotic pleasure in defecating. Defecating, you know, throwing excreta out. And probably a kind of erectogenic uh, uh, pleasure is also derived from this part of the body. The third phase, or probably the last phase that comes under the pre-Oedipal phase, according to Freud, is the phallic stage or the genital stage, better say the genital stage, when the genital uh, or the male organ uh, of the human child becomes the erotogenic song and the child becomes conscious of itself. And, uh, you know, th this is how he derives. Uh, the, uh, in fact, you know, I use the word he because the entire Freudian analysis is an analysis of the male psyche, not the female psyche, which he described, you know, uh, uh, the female psyche was described as a dark continent by Freud, which is very hard to analyze and which is not very easily uh, accessible to interpretation and analysis. Well, so the, in the third phase of the pre-Oedipal stage, uh, the phallus or, uh, you know, the male organ becomes the genitals, uh, uh, it, you know, it becomes uh, the erotogenic zone as far as Freudian analysis is concerned. Uh, probably uh, this is only a rough order of sequence of development, psychosexual development of the child. After these three phases, Freud says that there is a kind of uh, pleasure developed by the child uh, called autoeroticism. It is named autoeroticism. Autoeroticism means you know, a kind of narcissistic, narcissistic pleasure, a kind of narcissistic pleasure is derived by the child uh, by focusing upon itself and uh, the body. So the entire body of the child is now capable of providing a different kind of pleasure to the child. And this is the stage called autoeroticism. Child in this phase, according to uh, Freud, is totally anarchic, sadistic, aggressive, and excessively pleasure-seeking. Look at the words, anarchistic, sadistic, pleasure-seeking, excessively pleasure-seeking. When the child experiences this kind of a narcissistic pleasure with its own body called autoeroticism. The second phase of psychosexual development is referred to as the Oedipal phase or the Oedipal stage. Of course, we know what is Oedipal complex. Till now, the child doesn't feel any distinction between, uh, you know, its mother and itself. It's something like a comfortable diet. Diet means two people together. For everything, the child is taken care of by its mother. And according to Freud, like Oedipus in Sophocles' play, Oedipus Rex, develops a passion for its mother. Quite, uh, you know, wittingly or unwittingly, the child develops a passion for its mother. And like Oedipus, its father becomes the rival. Who is the enemy? 
because the mother is possessed by the father, therefore for the child the enemy is the father. And he has always this attempt to kill his father and to possess uh, its mother. This complex, this kind of a complex is common to all children according to Freud, particularly boys. And that is why he says that successfully negotiating the Oedipal complex or the desire for one's mother will create and ensure a balanced, a normal personality without any, any chances of suffering from abnormal behavior or you know disorders like hysteria or neurosis or psychosis for that matter. The diet between the child and the mother soon develops into a triad with the appearance of the father. And now you know what uh, Freud calls the fear of castration or the anxiety of castration operates at this stage. As we all know, the boy fears that he will be castrated if he desires for his mother. And this fear induces in him the thought and the necessity that he should not desire for his mother. And he consciously withdraws. And now on, he looks upon his father as the real patriarch who has great power and who is loved and respected by his, uh, you know, his own mother and other people around. And therefore, he defers his desire, represses the desire into the unconscious because unconscious is the ultimate, you know, repertoire of all the repressed, unfulfilled desires. And he decides that Sooner than later, he will also be another patriarch like his father. And he may get married to someone else, and thus he forgoes his desire for the mother. This is called the process of negotiating Oedipal complex successfully. Now he has completed the process of, you know, overcoming the Oedipal complex very, very successfully. He becomes a normal person. But suppose the child fails in overcoming this Oedipal complex and gets fixated, gets fixated, fixation, in some stage of uh, the psychosexual development or the early childhood period, what will be the result? According to Freud, the result will be disastrous. There could be two possibilities of symptoms, of disease. One is called neurosis, which can be treated and cured to a certain extent. But the latter is more horrible. That is called psychosis. And neurosis has its own different manifestations. It could be something like, you know, uh, phobic. It could be some fear. Or it could be something like hysteria. It could be uh, obsessional type of neurosis. So there are different types of neurosis that Freud talks about. But, you know, when it comes to psychosis, it is more dangerous because it cannot be cured and treated fully. Of course, medication could be given, therapy could be given, but you know, there is no guarantee that the patient will come back to its normal. There are two types of psychosis that he talks about. The first category is paranoia, and the second is schizophrenia. The first is paranoia, the second is schizophrenia. These are the two common types of psychosis from which there is no absolute cure according to Freud. So what I have said so far is just a summary of the Freudian psychoanalysis. There are other, you know, great theories. If you have a look at the major works of Sigmund Freud, that will give you an idea about his prolific writings and the kind of case studies he has undertaken during his, uh, you know, clinical period. He has written more than 300 articles and books and I have introduced only the major works by Freud. There are other areas like interpretation of dreams and uh, several, several other areas. But as far as uh, students at the PG level are concerned, this basic understanding of Freudian psychoanalysis will enable them to study uh, the later psycho 
analysts like the French Freud, who is called the French Freud, Jacques Lacan, who contributed significantly by making a clarion call, Return to Freud. And he attempted to uh, rework or rewrite, reformulate Freudian psychoanalysis in structuralist and post-structuralist terms in the late 20th century. So we will have another session on uh, uh, Lacanian contribution to psychoanalysis. Till then, thank you so much. Bye.